Members, we uh, move now to the Vulnerable Children Bill, and the question is that Part 3 stand part. Uh, Jacinda Ardern. Dear, it's my pleasure to uh, resume the debate on the Vulnerable Children's Bill when the um, House rose last night. We had moved on to, uh, I understand, Part 3 of the bill. Um, we have skipped from part one to part three. I think it's important to at least acknowledge why that is. Part two, which was a substantial um, part uh, of the bill, consisted of the child harm prevention orders. Now, just to recap, a little bit of a visual aid here, you can see that this middle section of the bill was quite substantial. This was all the child harm prevention orders. Um, now, that part of the bill was quite a significant um, step in our criminal justice system in the sense that it allowed for an order to be made for an individual not to, for instance, um, uh, work or um, be in contact with children, for instance, for up to 10 years without any conviction uh, or, or sentencing having occurred. So it was an uh, on balance of probability order that could be ordered, um, uh, set down by a court. So a significant step to be able to do that without there being any conviction first for that individual. Now the Minister decided, whilst this bill was still before the Select Committee, to remove that element of the bill. Now, there wasn't a lot of explanation given. One of the reasons why the Minister explained that she'd removed that provision, which we ultimately actually agree with, was, for instance, a small reference to the fact that the government was looking at a sex offender registry. Now, if there are any other issues that the Minister would like to give as an explanation for the removal of that bill, I would really appreciate the Minister using committee stages to do that because there was very little explanation. Uh, about the, the removal of those provisions, even though, as I've said, we were very sceptical. We said we'd support the bill to select committee to allow that bit to be debated, but remain sceptical even after that select committee process. So not disagreeing with the decision, just would like a little more context from the Minister, given it was such a significant part of her, of her bill. But as I um, read, highlighted last, last night, Mr Chair, we, we do support this bill. Part three in particular, because this is an omnibus bill, it has a range of um, uh, measures which um, are all a part of the Children's Action Plan. Uh, and there, I want to traverse in particular three parts of part three that uh, uh, are particularly uh, notable. Some I will leave but because there are many um, bits and pieces in this bill. But the first um, is a provision around subsequent children. Currently, within uh, child, youth and family, and when um, there are protection and care and protection issues uh, within a family, if there are children, multiple children removed from a family, if there is a subsequent child born into that family, the onus still ultimately is on child, youth and family to demonstrate that there are concerns for the safety of that child and for that child to be removed. The bill essentially removes that onus and that instead it's the onus becomes on the part of the um, of biological parents to demonstrate that they uh, have the uh, ability and, um, uh, and have made the changes necessary to be able to care for that child. I think that's probably the right way to go, reversing the, the burden of proof. We have seen a substantial number of cases where subsequent children have been uh, subjected to the same care and um, protection issues that their siblings have, but they almost go through a trial period themselves before any um, action is taken. So it is a very sad state of affairs to have to be able to put in that provision, but a necessary one. We do need to make sure that there are adequate protections in place, because again, it is an incredibly uh, significant thing for the state to remove a child. Uh, and so we want to make sure that we've got the oversight over SIFs that's required to ensure that robust decisions are made, particularly when we have had issues with um, a social worker practice, whether or not there's enough supervision for our social workers. They're under significant stress and there is high turnover. And one of the things that we've argued for are, um, for instance, having a separate complaints body for child, youth and family. Uh, so that in the same way that the police currently have an independent police conduct authority, that gives people faith in the system that if a decision is made that they ultimately believe is wrong, there is a separate organisation that they can go to 
to have that investigated um, adequately. Now, I think when we are uh, making changes as significant as this, adding in some of those um, processes to ensure that people have that extra level of comfort uh, is, is very uh, important indeed, and we continue to advocate that that happen for Mr. Chair, for child, youth, and family um, as we as we have uh, in the past. I want to come now to the special guardians um, provisions, and I think it's important, Mr. Chair, to look at these provisions um, in in context. The minister some years ago now, I think, recognised that there was a desire amongst foster. Um, uh, foster carers for them to have greater certainty in their relationship with the children they were looking after. Now, I would have thought that would have been a useful time to review our adoption laws, which are antiquated and not used because of the fact that they're not fit for purpose. But instead, uh, a decision was made to, to explore uh, the notion of home for life. And I think it had good motives. I, I absolutely do. It, it, it ultimately allowed uh, greater certainty for those foster families. But unfortunately, it also removed, at the time that foster carers moved into Home for Life situations, it did remove uh, a lot of the extra support for those families. Now, I don't mean just monetary support. For most families, that's not the concern that they have. Uh, it's the support when there are behavioural issues. Uh, it's the support particularly when parents end up going through the court system, as many do on an ongoing basis, to battle for the right to act as the primary caregiver for that child and to make decisions for the benefit of that child. Now, my concern is that when For Home for Life was set up, actually, this is the time that we probably need the special guardians provisioned so that we could actually match people's expectation that if they're in a home for life, they are the primary caregiver, they get to make decisions, that they won't be constantly hauled through the courts by biological parents who have ultimately proven that they no longer have shown the responsibility that means that they should get to, be, get to make all the decisions in that child's life anymore. My concern is that guardian, these special guardianship orders, which are meant to give greater weight to a caregiver over a set of biological parents who have basically proven they're not fit to parent, has to still go through quite a rigorous process to get to that place. Um, or the order, of course, must be made through the court but if you look at the provisions, uh, for instance, Mr Chair, um, around uh, the point at which the, uh, the court um, makes the orders, uh, it states that the court may only give a special guardianship order if the court is satisfied that under 2B, the person has exercised all available meca mechanisms available under the Care of Children Act to resolve disputes with any parent or other guardian of the child or young person. Um, it also states... Uh, specifically in relation to the child, that they must show that there has been, that the child or young person's welfare is being seriously disturbed as a result of uh, uh, ongoing uh, dispute, perhaps, with the, the caregiver, uh, sorry, between the caregiver and the biological parents. So the threshold is very, very high. Now, we need to keep in mind some of these parents are having to battle, these foster carers are battling uh, often biological parents who may, might, for instance, have a drug and alcohol issues, that have done something serious enough to have their children removed and are going through the courts over issues such as extra visitation rights, um, whether or not the caregivers um, need to move for work, um, taking the children on holiday. I've even heard parents raise issues with even just taking the children in their care to church. The, all of this can tr uh, trigger um, having to go through the court to battle a parent that, again, as I say, ultimately has had their children removed from them. So, yes, there is definitely a need for um, these provisions in this bill. My question is whether or not we are going to lose too many solid long-term foster carers on the way to getting to that point because of the threshold. Uh, and I've certainly heard a number of cases, as will the Minister, where foster uh, carers, um, caregivers, have, uh, have simply been exhausted by the system and felt unsupported in the process of simply trying to provide a stable home for the children um, uh, in, their, in their care. Now, what that would mean probably is that you would have to bring those, lower the thresholds um, for these provisions, or simply maybe it's time that we looked overall at the rights that the uh, uh, the balance of rights between parents who have had their children removed and their, um, and their caregivers, particularly their long-term caregivers. That's a big 
big call to make. But if we are uh, in trying to build a system that is ultimately focused on the needs of the child and the welfare of the child, then perhaps that warrants a review on that balance of rights, keeping in mind that, of course, uh, we know we constantly battle the long-term effects of children who are removed from their, um, removed from their families and are constantly trying to, to strike a balance between those very, very difficult um, issues, Mr Chair. But those are the statements on that particular provision I wanted to make, uh, and I will come back to f uh, further points yeah. later. I call the Honourable Member Rajin Prasad.